we're just going to get started with the housekeeping. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Andy Honnison from the Square Meter Group and Crowd Safety Training. Um, most of you probably know this already, but um, we are a, a training consultancy company. We, we deliver training courses and consultancy around the world to a number of, of different clients. So I won't go too much on advertising because I know people don't like it. So I'll, I'll move swiftly on. Hope everyone's well and um, looking forward to the prospect of maybe having some of this lockdown relief. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, throughout this talk today, we'll, Emma's going to talk for about an hour. And then after that, we will have 30 minutes of questions. The questions should be submitted through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen on the control bar. Um, if you submit your questions in there, there's a button in there that should allow you to like the question. If you like the question, it will move it up in the order of priority. Okay, so it will raise it to the top. We won't take any questions during the talk, um, so we don't sort of ruin the sort of continuity and flow. Okay, so if you just submit your questions through the Q&A function at the end, I will read them out to Emma and we'll discuss the answers and hopefully get you the answer that you, you want. Okay. Um, most of you have found it already. There's a chat function at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to talk to each other. Um, in past webinars we've run, we've encouraged people to share their LinkedIn details. Um, it's all about networking as well as learning, how any learning environment should be, in my opinion. So share your details, talk to each other in there, um, keep it all nice and clean, obviously. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to share details within that. Uh, slides will be available. I know some of the previous webinars, we haven't got them out yet, but they'll be all going onto our YouTube channel, which is now ready. So we should get them out as well. And copies of, of the recording will also be on there. Okay, so I think that's it from me. I'll shut up if you're not here to listen to me. And I will hand over to Emma Parkinson, who can introduce herself from Coventry University. Uh, hi, Andy. Thanks very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us, especially those people who've joined us from the other side of the world, where presumably it's quite a funny time of day at the moment. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity, Andy. Uh, for those who haven't met me, my name's Emma Parkinson. I'm the course director for Crowded Places and Public Safety at Coventry University and for Emergency Management and Resilience, so all our postgraduate programmes. Uh, my professional background is as a crowd manager as well, so um, I'm the lead on crowd safety at Glastonbury Festival. Um, and before I joined the world of academia, I specialised in large scale volunteer and mass deployment management. So I've seen this from both sides of the world, both the academic and the practitioner. And hopefully what I'm going to give you today is some sound practitioner guidance, um, but with just enough of a foot in the academic camp for you to be able to, to understand why we approach some of these principles the way we do. So we're looking today at integrated emergency management. Specifically, this has a live events slant because I know that's what a lot of us do. We manage crowded places, um, but it's applicable in whatever field you work. Um, but first, we'll do a little about what today is not about. Um, this is not a complete guide to emergency planning. Um, if you want that, we do run a postgraduate master's. It will take you several years. Um, there's an awful lot to emergency planning beyond what we're going to do here. If you find yourself absolutely fascinated by this subject, and I must admit, I thought it was the most exciting thing in the world. Um, it's how I ended up doing it. If you're a nosy person, emergency planning is just the greatest subject because it's so cross-disciplinary. But if you find yourself absolutely fascinated, we've got a couple of guides that I recommend you look up, emergency preparedness and emergency response and recovery. So um, those make an absolutely fantastic starting point. They're government guidance. You can find them on the government website um, and they begin to introduce to you some of the concepts that underpin emergency planning in the UK. Um, before we just get on to those, the other thing this is not, this is not a guide to interoperable working on the front line of an emergency. Um, the kind of thing that in the UK you might consider the JESIP, Joint Emergency Services Interoperability Principles and Programme, to be about. Um, this is about what goes behind emergency planning. This is about how you integrate the processes behind emergency planning rather than simply looking at your response on the front line. Um, and finally, it's not a guide to the specific workings and obligations of emergency planning legislation. 
this is different wherever you are in the world. Um, there are some duties, though, that it, it pays to bear in mind as you're looking at emergency planning, major incident planning, because if you can understand how emergency services work, if you can understand what they need from you, it can make your emergency plans that much more effective. So basically, in an emergency, you're likely to find yourself working with category one responders, the police, fire, ambulance, your local authority, and with category two responders who are a range of additional appointed people. And they have some duties that you need to bear in mind. Um, these duties are usually held between them. But if you're planning a large scale event and you are likely to be responsible for that emergency response, think about how they have to plan up front. So they have a duty of coordination, which means they have to work together to create coordinated, consistent sets of plans and information so that when an emergency happens, they're not working out how to work. They are simply getting on with running it because they've already done all that work already. They have a duty to cooperate in emergencies, and that's a duty that extends to you as the manager of a live event. Um, they have duties of information sharing. Now, can you think about how you use information within your organisation? Can you effectively share information internally with your organisation? Is your information in a position, in a situation, uh, in a file that can be shared appropriately with those external authorities? Have you thought about GDPR and what you might need to share in an emergency? Just are you ready for something like that? But also what we are going to be looking at substantially today is the duty to prepare for emergencies from a perspective of risk. Um, looking at um, what is likely to happen to you and creating sets and suites of plans that are based upon the most likely incidents that you're going to face. Um, so that's, that's basically what we're going to look at today. For those who've been taught by me before, you'll notice I'm already really struggling because I'm not pacing about and waving my arms in the air. Um, I'm not suited to being constrained into a little box. Um, so I will apologise if I occasionally get a little bit overexcited and move around a little bit too much. I'm trying really hard to keep still. Um, so what are we looking at today? Um, it's a whistle-stop tour of some of the key principles that understand emergency, uh, underpin emergency planning across the world. Um, there are differences in the legislative nature of emergency planning across the world. Some systems are pretty similar. The UK and Australian systems are not unrelated, for example. Um, some are very different across the world, depending upon the state of your nation, um, the state of your responsibility. Um, but there are some underpinning theoretical approaches that are pretty much identical wherever you are in the world and certainly won't hurt you to apply. So we're going to look at some different types of integration today, some different areas to consider for integration. And as I said, the, the glaring omission here is that we will not be looking at JESSIP. I know that that's been looked at before when you've talked about these lectures, but also I think when we talk about JESSIP and response, we then very much tend to forget about the other areas of integration that are so interesting, so important, but so frequently overlooked. So I've deliberately overlooked JESSIP today. We're going to talk about risk identification and a tiny amount about risk perception. So we talk about planning from a, an all hazards risk based approach. Um, we'll be looking at some of the problems with those risk based approaches and how you can work around those. We'll be taking into consideration this idea of all hazards approaches. Um, we'll go into this in more detail later on, but the idea of all hazards approaches is quite simply that we make plans that will deal with whatever we face. There's a temptation when we look at something from a risk perception basis to design plans that are all about specific risks. But the all hazards approach instead enables us to create suites of generic plans so that we can cope with whatever is thrown at us. Because if we know one thing about disasters and emergencies, it's that they are not always entirely predictable. We're going to be looking at the importance of subsidiarity and empowerment within your emergency planning structures and why these are so vital. Um, and then we're also going to look at some of the basics of good planning for emergency management, some of the key features you need to recognise as you're creating your planning suites. So uh, why do we plan? 
Well, I've shamelessly stolen the motto of the Event Safety Alliance for this because actually I think it works really well. It's also the motto of some little country just over the Atlantic as well, but I'm more concerned with the Event Safety Alliance. Um, their motto here is e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Um, and this is why I feel integration is so important. Um, it has the power to create a single unified response out of a very disparate collection of organizations, agencies and actors. We talk about emergency and what comes up time and time again is that confusion in the early period of an emergency, that lack of understanding about who is responsible for what. So either people don't undertake a task or tasks are duplicated or tasks are made unnecessarily complicated because people haven't worked out how to integrate, share information, and work to a single hymn sheet. Um, so this idea of out of many, one, um, I think is really valuable. Um, in our specialist world, particularly, the emergency services need our support to assist us. Um, there are still people uh, in our world who believe that when things go wrong at their live events, the emergency services will come dashing over the hill on a white charger to save them. Um, Unfortunately, this isn't the case. It isn't the case for many reasons. Um, one, we need to take responsibility for our own actions and plan to the best of our abilities. Two, those emergency services have a huge job to do and we are but one of the tasks assigned to them. Um, they don't have the resources, the money to come dashing over the hill all the time. But three, events are a very specialist field and nobody knows our event, our capabilities, our resources as well as we do. So if the emergency services are going to support us, we need to be able to support them really effectively. And that's what great integrated emergency planning can do. And that's the key to a really successful major incident or emergency response with everybody knowing what they need to do, everybody working together to a set of plans that are already coordinated with a set of processes that underpin those plans. So, what do I need you to think about as you're creating your own emergency planning process? And I'd urge you to think not just in terms of your emergency plan here, but in terms of your overall process. Um, people often think that they've dealt with emergency planning because they've written an emergency plan. But actually, the plan is just the final expression of extensive negotiation, consideration, collection of information, development of good processes. Um, and I'd like you to think in those terms as you think about your emergency planning suite. Um, the kind of things you're going to need to think about, you know, what should you be prepared for? What are the likely risks to your organisation, to your event, to your staff, to your public? We'll take a look at those in a list form at the end. But there's the obvious big ticket items. There's things like weather, there's things like malicious attack, there's things like communication failure. All of these things are entirely foreseeable. I'd like you to think about what resources you have and what resources you're going to need in an emergency. Um, one of my biggest hates in emergency planning, and it's something that you see all the time, is an assumption that there will be perfect behaviour and perfect coordination in the event of an emergency. Um, time and time again, I see phrases like, in the event of an emergency, the stewards will create a cordon. <laughs> no, they won't. In the event of an emergency, half the stewards will create a cordon. Half will be on the way to the car park and get there before the public. You know, be realistic about what your staff will do in an emergency. Be realistic about their capabilities and what they can achieve. People are amazing and they do amazing things in times of an emergency, but don't just assume that that emerging behaviour is going to be something you can rely on. Be absolutely honest with yourself about the nature of your resources. I want you to think about the actions that you can employ to reduce or mitigate the impact or likelihood of a hazard. And this isn't just about risk control in the sort of old fashioned sense of I've made a matrix based risk assessment and I've put a control in place. So everything's there. I'd like you to think about those underpinning, underlying features that you create within your planning process, which might actually help. So it might be about good communication processes. It might be about reliable technical communication, 
but it might also be about how you build a culture of trust and honesty in your staff so that they will communicate properly with you and with each other. I'd like you to think about how you're communicating your emergency plans to your team. Um, frequently, it might be that they don't need the whole major incident plan. They just need to know their part in it. Their part in it might be something that you communicate on the day because you already have great communication processes in place. Other people will need a little bit more information. Other people will need loads. But simply distributing a major incident plan is not a sufficient answer to sharing your planning processes. And I'd also like you to think as well about how you're going to get started on recovery in the event of a major incident. Uh, under UK law, um, the requirement for recovery planning starts, you must start planning for your recovery within three hours of the incident occurring, uh, which seems really harsh. Um, surely within three hours, you're still absolutely in the teeth of response. Um, and yes, you probably are. But it's now long recognised that decisions you make within that response phase can severely impact your ability to recover. Um, so your good emergency plans should also consider the steps you need to take towards recovery. Um, quite often it's easy to think of one-off events as not needing a recovery plan because, you know, we're, we'll all go home on Sunday night and that will be the end of that. But increasingly, events such as ours have long term reputations. We have a duty to our, our visitors. Um, we have a duty to the sector to make sure that the entire sector is perceived as safe. And just because our event had a problem doesn't mean that that should reflect on the entire sector. So we need to get the recovery right for the sake of all of us. So I've used some, some phrases there, some phrases like mitigation, some phrases like recovery. Um, and this is perhaps the first part of um, integrated emergency planning. This is what people classically recognise as integrated emergency planning. Um, it's a cyclical thing. Um, you can start anywhere uh, in this particular process. Um, this is an American version of the cycle. There are versions from all over the world. They use slightly different terminology, but they all look like this. And the idea is that your plans and your planning process should have an eye to every single phase of the disaster cycle. Very frequently, uh, we create major incident plans that only ever really look at response. Um, that's the exciting bit. That's what we're going to do when it all goes terribly wrong and we're going to charge in and we're going to save the day. Um, however, a really good integrated emergency plan will consider all of these cycles. So if we were to start at the top, for example, we'd be looking at prevention. You know, what can we do within our event to stop a major incident occurring? Um, how are we actually going to uh, work hard to make sure that something doesn't express itself? We then move into preparation phases. Um, the preparation phase is, well, let's assume that something's going to happen and therefore we need to be ready for it. The emergency plan itself is a great example of part of the preparation phase. Uh, preparation might also involve training key members of staff. Another phase that we think about a lot is mitigation. Mitigation in terms of emergency planning is often thought of as those huge and sweeping changes you make to your society, to your event, to change the very fabric and structure of what you do so that emergencies simply can't express themselves. Mitigation might be about changing the social capabilities of people at your event. It might be about undertaking actions that build resilience in your audience so that emergencies do not express as badly when they happen. It might be about changing substantial parts of the land use planning for your event so that you avoid the worst of the floods or you avoid the worst of the weather. Um, these are these big sweeping overriding pieces and actually this is where preventing accidents, which is what emergency planning is about. It's, a, it's not just about being able to respond to the bad things when they happen. It's about undertaking a breadth of work to actually try and prevent things happening in the first place. And then, as represented by our big streak of red lightning here, the worst happens. Um, and sometimes the worst happens out of a conflation of circumstances you couldn't possibly have imagined. So that's when we need to be ready to respond. 
The response phase is our emergency plans in action, but it's also all those underpinning features. It's good communication. It's good trust among partners. It's an understanding of the information that we can share. It's good situational awareness. Um, all of those things that enable a response to be staged quickly and efficiently. Um, and then again, we move into recovery. And how does our event recover? Um, that's both in the very short term, the immediate safety of our patrons, and in the longer term, looking at the future of the event and potentially the future of the industry. Um, there's been some fantastic examples of recovery in this industry. I know that Morton from Ross Kilder is on this call today, um, and I think they should be held up as a great example of recovery in the live event industry. So we've talked about this cycle. These cycles are the same wherever you work in the world. And the first stage of integration is to make sure that when you're creating your plans, you're considering all these phases of the cycle. And then you think about how your process should be approached. Um, and we talk about a risk based approach to emergency planning. Um, we want to work in terms of risk um, because we need to be efficient in our planning. We need to plan for what is reasonably foreseeable. Um, and we also need to make sure that those plans are, are robust, they're proportionate and they're appropriate. We don't want to be spending an enormous amount of money and time mitigating risks that actually are less likely to express themselves. And we don't want to be caught out by those smaller risks that we almost take for granted as being part of our industry. So I picked this cycle. This is a US cycle. Again, there are similar versions of this all over the world, but I, I really like this one because of its consideration of capabilities. So if we again start at the top here, uh, we talk about identifying and assessing risk. Uh, this is a, a standard process that so many of us, I think, will be familiar with from this industry. Um, but perhaps it's the next step, uh, which I've already alluded to, that I think is really, really important here. Um, estimating our capability requirements. So what do we actually need to be able to do to respond to an incident? What do we have? What capabilities have we got? How will they behave? in times of an accident and are they sufficient effectively what we're doing in this phase is we're doing a gap analysis what have we got and what do we need um, and this is the time to be honest with yourself now i know that people quite often say things to me like oh but we can't write things like that down in plans because local authorities will see that we're not ready this is where we move from a plan to a process and um, this is something you should be doing in the background working out what you have and whether it's sufficient um, and if it's not, then you need to work out how to build those capabilities. Do you need more volunteers? Do you need better training for your volunteers? Do you need more effective means of communication on your site, better radio coverage? Do you need shared buy-in to things like crowd safety from several different groups of people, several different um, stages or area organisers, whatever that might be? Um, and then she plan to how you're going to deliver those capabilities. Again, this moves us back towards the actual plan itself um, and how people are going to carry out the duties that you need them to carry out. I'd also really hope, and I think this is a big missing phase in the UK, which is another reason for picking this diagram, ask people to consider validating their capabilities. Um, in the short term nature of the live events world, this validation is something that's considerably overlooked. Um, we assume that we've got a capability, we run our show all right, and as long as nothing significant goes wrong in our show, um, we assume that everything's okay. But actually, is it? Have you really thought that through? So something that I'm very proud to be a part of at uh, Glastonbury, for example, is not only do we build our capability within our audience, but then we have an audit process that runs throughout our show. We're constantly auditing our SIA provision to make sure that the right people with the right badge are stood in the right place at the right time to the numbers we ordered, that they've had enough sleep, that they've been fed, that their uniform's all right, that they know their jobs and their duties, um, that they're being appropriately supervised. That process ticks on all the time. But additionally, because we've identified crowd risk as one of the biggest risks that we face, um, we hire an independent auditor who comes in 
who looks at my plans, who looks at my team and what we're delivering and make sure that the plans are fit for what we say they're fit for and that we are genuinely delivering them as we say we'll deliver them. Um, I think the live events industry is a, a great example of where frequently people write things down on paper, but then they don't deliver them in that way. Culture and tradition tend to override that pure planning. And finally, I'd urge you within your risk based approach to planning and your capability based approach to planning to review and update your plans constantly. This is where your logbooks come in useful. You know, what happened? What did you cope with? What could have gone better? What could be easier? What processes have we introduced that we don't need, as well as what extra layers of process should we be introducing? So I'd urge you to think about risk and then from risk move into capability because that really is your most effective control of risk. We're also in a minute going to take a look at vulnerability and how that impacts on our constructions of risk as well. So while you're assessing risk, how are you deciding what to plan for? Um, the world of risk perception that we're about to step into is an enormous world. We teach whole modules on this at Coventry. Um, and if you decide that you're interested in this, please be very careful when you stumble down this rabbit hole because it's huge. Um, what I would say is when we come to thinking about how we construct this risk, um, humans have amazing imaginations, brilliant imaginations. It's why we make incredible disaster movies. Um, but we are generally, as a species, pretty dreadful at maths. Now, you might have a maths A level, but bear with me with this one, because we're talking about some quite abstract maths at this point. We live in an uncertain world where there is incomplete information. It's what makes risk and emergency management so fascinating, uh, but which is also what makes it so difficult because we're only ever playing with half a deck of cards. We need to make risk decisions very quickly. As humans, we've survived as long as we have by being able to make risk decisions very quickly. We look at two elements of this risk. You know, we look at how serious the severity of this risk and we look at the likelihood of this risk we're really good at imagining how bad something could be but actually it turns out we're really really bad at imagining how likely something is going to be because our brains have developed a system which kept us alive in that fast moving world where we were all hunting and living in caves and running away from things with big teeth. All right. So um, this is known as heuristics. Um, these are quick thinking rule of thumb processes that humans employ, but they result in biases. Um, all sorts of things influence uh, how we are biased as humans. And again, these biases, they're not a problem per se as long as you recognize them and they were designed to keep us alive they have some value um the best way to describe this is actually to give you an example um because if you have to think about everything then you're not going to survive long enough for the the thoughts to actually um be made real so if you think about the way you process risk um imagine you're walking through the jungle all right, so you're walking through the jungle, you've got an eye out on what's going to jump out at you, you've got an eye out on everything that's happening around you. Um, you see something in that jungle. It's big and it's orange and it's stripy and you haven't got time to be thinking, oh, I wonder what that is. It's big and it's orange and it's stripy. I wonder if it will be my friend. Instead, what you should be thinking is tiger. Your brain needs to leap immediately to the most likely conclusion of what is big and orange and stripy, because only by reacting really, really quickly do you stand a chance of staying alive. I say, don't look at the tiger, look at the effect heuristic. Your, the effect heuristic is you tend to overestimate the possibility of things happening if the outcome of those things makes you sad, makes you feel unhappy because your brain is desperate to avoid things that make you unhappy. Now, a tiger at a zoo might make you quite happy, but a tiger in your back garden, less of a happy making thing. You need to be able to react very, very quickly. So your brain is designed to leap to conclusions about things that make you unhappy. And this means you tend to overestimate the likelihood of them happening. 
This is just one heuristic of many. There are heuristics that mean how easily you remember something influences how likely you think it is to happen. Um, there are yeah, just thousands and thousands of heuristics originally developed by a couple of research, uh, research economics people, behavioral economists called Kahneman and Tversky. I uh, highly recommend their work if you're interested in this. Um, but if you think something is more likely to happen because of these personal impacts, then your risk assessment is going to be skewed. This is why when you are assessing risk as part of a fully integrated planning suite, I'd really urge you to work alongside other people in the generation of that risk picture. Um, years ago for my master's dissertation, uh, I decided to look for evidence of these heuristics and I asked uh, event planners what risks they thought were inadequately prepared for, what risks they thought we really needed to look at more closely. Uh, and then in a second set of interviews, I asked them what had happened to them in their personal working life. And to a person, what I found was that they were all scared of things that had happened to them, things that had felt uncontrollable to them. Um, they were all actually from the same live event, but they came out with risk assessments that were wildly different for that event because they were all scared of different things. They'd all experienced different things. So when you are planning from an integrated potential, um, work with different people on their view of risk because you will get a much more effective, a much richer picture, which starts to wipe out your own biases. Um, and we can't help these biases. They're what's kept us alive so far. We just need to recognize them and work beyond them. Um, one of the other biases is this one of my particular favorite this bias this bias is called the dread hypothesis and this is from the psychometric school of risk and is another uh, thing to look out for the dread hypothesis is quite remarkable um it suggests that um the more unknowable something is the more incomplete our information but the easier to imagine a really big impact it is our brains believe this is more likely to happen. So it was the reason that getting people to quit smoking for so long was very hard because people weren't particularly scared of smoking. It killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people every year, but it was deemed to have a very minor localized impact. That kind of, oh, it'll never happen to me sort of thing. Whereas um, terrorism is hugely feared because it has this huge, unknowable, uncontrollable impact. I could stop smoking anytime I want, but I can't stop terrorism. And therefore it becomes bigger and scarier. And because it's bigger and scarier, it interplays with the effect heuristic. And all of a sudden I've raised it right up my list of things to be frightened of, whether that is relevant or not. So the dread hypothesis, that wonderful word, um, is the reason terrorism is so successful. It's designed to completely freak us out. It's designed to frighten us because it's designed to have a huge impact on our lives and it works unfortunately it works um but just remember that that's why it works and it's very important to plan for instance like this but you also need to understand the psychological reason that you're scared of incidents like this keep that in perspective and remember to plan for things that have a far higher likelihood of occurring. Um, that delightful little line across the bottom of the screen here um, is something that we face all the time at live events. There's a much higher likelihood of a misuse of drugs occurring, of a dangerous batch of drugs reaching your audience occurring, um, of batches of drugs bought onto your site by sellers who've realised they're snide and who don't want to poison their usual customers. These are all far more reasonable risks to plan for. But people frequently don't until these events start happening. So again, it's about creating that rich risk picture and being very realistic about what is likely to happen at your event, as well as these external big ticket items. The next thing to think about in terms of integrating, once you've got your risk in your plan, is remembering that your major incident plan itself should not stand entirely alone. Um, there is this temptation to see the major incident plan as something that sits behind a glass panel in the office and in case of emergency smash glass, remove the plan. Um, the plan should be intimately connected with every other plan that you are managing your event 
by. Um, they should dovetail beautifully. Um, in the real world, outside of live events, we talk about creating these dovetailed plans where the plans for factories must integrate with the plans for hospitals, which must integrate with the plans for welfare. Um, and a live event is absolutely no different. Um, the reason I adore live events pretty much more than anything in the world is because they are a microcosm of that world. They are a chance for us to engage entirely with all the elements that make for the successful running of a society in microcosm. Um, so our major incident plan in these cases needs to connect to all sorts of other elements. Um, it should be intimately correct, connected to our event operations plan. It should share the same fallback procedures. It should map to the constructions of your um, organogram for who's in charge of what and when. Um, it should connect really tidily to your welfare and medical plans because those are going to be what's called upon if you have a major incident. You might think tangentially from there about how it connects to your teenagers and vulnerable persons plan, because in a major incident, different people are going to need different amounts of help and support and protection. So you've got to make sure it maps across to your usual arrangements. Of course, in our world, your major incident plan will connect to your crowd management plan because you will be having constant adjustments to how you manage your crowd all the way through an event. Um, and some of those might be to avoid major incident. Um, in the event of a major incident, how you deal with your people, how you move your people around is going to be really important. So it should connect intimately. Um, there are all sorts of internal plans that should connect to your major incident plan. But I'd also like you to look outside. So we've said here that you need to think about your regional emergency plan as well. Uh, in the area where you live or where your event is held, there will be a local resilience forum. This is the expression of the duty of management of emergencies that is placed upon category one responders, such as the police, fire, ambulance services. Um, they have a duty to plan a multi-agency coordinated approach to the management of incidents that happen in their area. And you are no different. You are part of that area when you join that um, that county, when you move your event into that space, you become part of the mix of what could happen in that area. So you really need to familiarise yourself with what the local agencies need from you. Um, it's no good relying on the fact that the hospital will have enough beds. It's no good relying on the fact that the police will have enough people to support you. You really need to work out how to integrate with their plans so that in the event of a major incident, you're ready. Um, some perfect examples of this have come with high weather in the last summer um, and indeed frequently. Um, I've been to, well, I've, I've heard of and I've attended at several festivals where high wind, for instance, has been a problem in the last year. Um, so Boardmasters, for example, took the very difficult decision to cancel their event last year, did it brilliantly. Um, but part of that consideration can't only be the festival, part of that consideration has to be the impact of the festival on the area outside the event. What will that do to the local facilities? What will that do to the local transport hubs? What will that do to the local authorities' rest centre and welfare plans? Um, if you can't absorb all those people in your site, is there going to be somewhere safe for them to go until they can get to their onward destination? When you move to a community, you are part of that community and you have a responsibility to consider that community in your plans. It's just another facet of integration. And of course, we're integrating a load of people. Um, if you look at advice for integrating emergency plans and you go back to academic advice, um, what you'll see frequently is, oh, you must integrate with the police, you must integrate with the emergency services. But we're integrating so much more in the live events world because we deal with very specific groups of people to make our events safe. You're integrating within the functions of your own crews at a live event. That might be the crowd safety manager, the medical manager, rigging, sound, lights. All of these things have to be brought together in a single plan. We all know the very simplest plans, a showstop plan, 
is actually really complicated when you start to imagine, right, what are we going to get on the big screens? What are we going to do with the house lights? What are we going to do if we lose power? How are we going to announce things to an audience? All of a sudden, just that one process has dozens of facets linked to it. What are we going to do with our doors? What are we going to do with our front of house staff? All of a sudden, it's enormous. Um, and that's just within our own crew. Um, if you're running live events, you've got touring and local crews to consider. You've got the touring crew who've come in with their own idea of how they manage their show, but you've got the local crew who know exactly how they manage their venue. They will have venue specific plans. They will know the area. They will know the vulnerabilities in the area, the strengths of the area. Um, and all of a sudden you've got to mesh that in every venue that you take your tour through. Um, you've got to integrate between the crew on the road and the management. The management who might be hundreds or thousands of miles away and have no real idea of what you actually face on the road. A lot of those management teams have never been on the road themselves. They don't know what you're facing on a daily basis. You've got to integrate between the production itself and the authorities in your area. Um, that could be um, a direct relationship through a safety advisory group, such as is held with festivals in the UK, or it could be a second or third hand relationship between a venue that holds the main relationship with the authorities and you. So this can be really disconnected. It's really important to try and connect that together so that you understand what's needed of you, what's requested in the area, but what you can rely on in the event of an emergency. You've got to integrate between the production and the artist themselves, because how the artist handles an emergency, how the artist behaves can be the trigger for an emergency. Um, and sometimes these connections are thinner than you would like them to be. Um, artists really don't much care about emergency plans by and large. They care about the content of their show, delivering a good performance. We don't hire them because they write good plans. Um, and therefore creating that integration so the artist knows what's expected of them and how to behave is really, really vital. Um, and also avoid the traps of focusing on proximate failure. Uh, remember the distal failure too. Those failures that happen a long way from your event but might have a really specific impact. Um, I'm minded very much of the great example that Mick Upton used to use, which was the Arad Festival. Yes, lots of things went wrong at the gates of that event to cause a crush against those gates of that event. However, some of the really important things that went wrong went wrong hundreds of miles away with the ticketing and marketing process that led to far too many people being at that event with an expectation of entry right so things that happen a long way from your event are often really vital to integrate uh, who else are you integrating so we've talked about these internal functions you've got a lot of people on your site um, production infrastructure safety teams security teams artist liaison teams artist management your front of house staff your pit staff stewards concessions stage management drivers riggers plant specialists fitters box office audience comms everybody on your site this is an enormous job and everybody's got a part to play you know, in the event of an emergency, if the staff running your concessions are wearing your uniform, they look like part of your crew. In the event of an emergency, are those staff going to be able to adequately advise and support members of the public? If normally what they do is dish up chips and coke for a living. Um, in an emergency, the public will look to them. So have you integrated them into their plan, into your plans? Do they know what they're supposed to be doing? Can they help? You're also integrating your head office, you know, your chairperson, your promoter, your accountants, the artist representation, lawyers, marketeers, your audience communications. All of these things need to be brought into your plans. Audience communications is a remarkable one. Um, communications that happen from hundreds of miles away from your site in an emergency can be really damaging. In an emergency, do you know who is talking to your audience and how you're going to do it? And um, finally, consider things like your private suppliers who will have their own ways of doing things, their own ways of managing things. Um, I always think security is a great example for this. One particular site I work on has nine principal security suppliers because that's the scale of the site. 
each of those has their own culture, their own way of communicating, their own ways of behaving, um, their own ways of supporting their staff in an emergency. How are you overriding that or taking advantage of it to bring them together to work as an integrated unit in an emergency? Um, you've got your venue, staff and management. These are permanent. These are temporary. Um, sometimes you're working on a fixed site. Uh, sometimes it's private land. You know, fixed venues see a different tour, night in, night out, with different requirements, different audiences different people. Um, so it's really important to make sure that they are bought on board. Um, there's the venue owners to consider. The venue owners are frequently very, very distant. The venue might be part of a group which has its own policies, its own approaches, its own procedures. And again, if you're going into a venue, you need to understand that so that you don't get this grinding of the gears between your processes and the processes of the venue that you're visiting. There are suppliers and concessions to that local venue, some of whom will have been in there an even shorter time than you. There might be TV crews that have just shot in to film a tiny bit of your venue. There might be concessions, giveaways, marketing uh, elements. All of these things need to be engaged with. But there's also the community around your venue. Um, some of those are very formally organised groups, some informal groups, some individual contact. But your emergency plans need to consider how you are going to work with that community in the event of an emergency. Will that community help you or hinder you? And what is your role in supporting that community if the actions of your event are likely to impede upon them? For instance, is a mass evacuation of your event going to prevent emergency services help reaching that local communication, that local community, because you've blocked up every road for 10 miles in every direction. Really need to think about what that community needs from you, what that community is scared of, and what that community can offer you in terms of support. Integration also requires you to think about how you, as an event, integrate with local authorities, city authorities, state organisations. You are simply one element that needs to fit in to a well-structured emergency planning system, which covers off things like police activity, fire coverage and medical provision in your area. Um, in certain countries and at certain events, structures of government and emergency planning and management are compulsory. So, for instance, if you work in the United States at a live event, you will be it will be considered essential for you to have undertaken your integrated emergency management training. Um, this is available on government websites. Anybody can do it. Have a look. It's fascinating. Um, but you've got to integrate with the local systems that exist where you are. And you've got to remember that culturally issues of emergency management and law enforcement can be very different depending upon where you are in the world. Um, the amount of help you can expect to get, the amount of freedom you have to make your own plans. All of these can be really different depending upon where you are in the world. You also have a duty to integrate with the law. Um, I know often people at live events have a slightly piratey approach um, and um, while lots of us are very responsible and the kind of people that come to webinars like this are extremely responsible people, we've all met those people in our industry who are not nearly so responsible. But legally your emergency plans and your emergency process must reflect the law of the jurisdiction where you operate. So that might be safety specific law, we might be thinking about things like you know, the Health and Safety at Work Act, but we might also be thinking about how you integrate with your local control of major accident hazard plans, uh, for example, or the local pipelines that run through your area, which make you subject to the pipelines regulations, um, the DC explosive environments regulations. You know, all of these things are absolutely relevant. Um, your plans must also relate to your liability uh, as the employer and as the occupier. Um, I, I find it depressing the number of people I still meet in this industry who think that volunteers are not subject to the Health and Safety at Work Act. Everybody is subject to the Health and Safety at Work Act just because you're not being paid does not exempt you. Um, you have a duty of care to the audience and you have a duty of care to your team and your plans need to reflect all of this. People somehow often feel that emergency plans are an excuse to abrogate responsibility. Um, I see dangerous things put into emergency plans all the time. 
your emergency plan must reflect the law. Um, just because there's an emergency ongoing, that's no excuse to avoid the law. Um, finally, who else are you integrating? Well, your audience. Your audience is a vital part of that integration. Um, and this is something that people forget all the time. Um, quite often, the only time people think about the audience is when they suddenly come to communicate with them in an emergency. A bit of a heads up, if the first time you try and talk to your emerge audience is in the teeth of an emergency, um, there is no point trying to talk to your audience because you don't have a trusted relationship. You don't have um, a viable conduit for information. Um, I guess this is a really great example of where emergency planning is a process and an integrated process rather than simply a set of plans. Because the process of talking to your audience should begin weeks or months before your event. The process of becoming a trusted provider of information, the process of becoming a partner with your audience when your audience makes decisions enables you to start to influence those decisions. Realistically, the audience should be the key stakeholder in your emergency plan, but people frequently forget to integrate the audience and they forget that that integration is a long term piece of work. Um, and the audience itself offers another characteristic. We talked earlier about capability of your organisation, but the flip side of capability is vulnerability and that vulnerability renders someone more susceptible to risk. You need to think about the vulnerabilities of your audience. You know, an emergency for an audience of team, teens is different for an audience of seniors. The triggers will be different. The outcomes will be different. Um, and things that look like an emergency to some don't look like an emergency to others. Um, you know, for a teenager coming home from a festival, starving, hungry, exhausted, soaking wet, covered from head to foot in mud, is a rite of passage. It's exciting. It's thrilling. It's hilarious that your parents want to hose you down on the driveway before they let you in the house. Um, for a Cliff Richard audience, that would be an entirely different thing um, and would be considered a major emergency. Some audiences are more vulnerable than others. They want different things. Um, recognise too the cultural frameworks of your crew and the location of your and the location. Um, vulnerabilities hide in plain sight. If your crew are exhausted, if your crew are confused, if they're being very badly managed, they are themselves potentially vulnerable. They may have worked away from home for weeks with no access to money or laundry or social support or mental health support. Vulnerabilities are hidden all over the place and some of the toughest looking people can be the most vulnerable. Um, so what is the impact of vulnerability when you are planning? Um, is your audience of the age and fit to make significant decisions about their own safety? Um, do they genuinely understand the implications of what's happening to them? Um, will they understand and respect a showstop? Um, I have before now stood on the stage of a structurally unsound venue wearing a hard hat with a loud hailer asking people to leave the venue. Um, and the audience just wouldn't leave because they were teenagers and they were all absolutely in love with the singer and they assumed that the singer couldn't have gone far so they were going to stay in case he came back. They had no idea of the danger that they were in even as we were asking them to leave a venue with a flapping roof. Um, so really think about how you're going to make that work. Is your audience fit to evacuate? If you're at a festival and their only means of leaving is a car and they are drunk, intoxicated, your plans need to take into account the fact that they cannot evacuate themselves. Um, can they evacuate alone? Are they of age to evacuate alone? Do they only have an evacuation, a leaving strategy that involves parents who may be miles away? Um, what do you need to get those people out? And if evacuation isn't realistic, what's your alternative? These are all considerations of vulnerability for emergency planning in the context of our events. Other things that you might need to be looking at. Show stop plans, we've talked about those. Evacuation plans, evacuation plans if evacuation isn't suitable or isn't necessary. Mass casualties plan and how you're going to cope with a sudden large influx of injuries. How are you going to cope with an artist no show or an artist that has to be evacuated uh, from a venue when you need to evacuate that artist with the minimum of audience fuss possible? 
How are you going to cope with severe weather? It might be storms, it might be floods, it might be a heat wave that involves water management plans. All of these things should be integrated. How are you going to cope with power outage? How are you going to cope with loss of communications? Will your plans fall back to a graceful position if you cannot communicate? Um, as we learned last summer, um, communications is one of the most vulnerable parts of our systems, both accidentally and with intentional malicious damage to communication systems. So do you have plans that will work even if you can't communicate? How are you going to readmit people if you've already evacuated them? What are the impacts of drugs and alcohol on plans? Uh, what's your social media management plan, both prior to and during an emergency? How might you deal with fire, structural collapse, crowd dynamics and more? There is so much to consider in these plans. Now, I don't urge you to make specific plans for each of these events. I urge you to look at this all hazards approach where if you need to evacuate, you don't need a separate evacuation plan for structural collapse, fire, flood, malicious event. You just need one good evacuation plan. All right. So think of it in those terms. Think about a small number of generic all hazards plans. This minimizes the number of plans you need, but maximizes the number of scenarios that you can deal with. It also avoids this illusion of planning to cover every eventuality. Um, I love this phrase. This is known as counterfactual fallacy, this suggestion that um, everything is going to be OK because I've planned absolutely everything. You can't plan absolutely everything when it comes to major incidents and disasters that's not how they express themselves so good generic plans enable you to cope with the broadest range of eventualities possible um, they should integrate with the rest of your planning suite um, a generic plan that integrates well that takes an all hazards approach that is minimal in the amount it forces people to read is more likely to be read learned and used and it's much easier to test train an exercise to a meaningful standard because you're not asking people to wade through pages and pages. Plans should be clear, concise. Um, they should integrate and minimise the burden of preparation for integration. They should be shared across all um, of the partners. Don't use words, use diagrams, maps, bullet points. Keep your shared elements in central plans, cross-reference, don't repeat information. Make your plans simple to navigate, give them version control, good structure, page numbering, accurate contents. All of these things make them easy to use. Um, it should be usable. It should reflect your available equipment and structures as well as your actions. This is back to what capability you've really got. A good plan should have clear triggers and be augmented with situation monitoring and decision support tools. Um, the number of people that respond slowly to an emergency because they hadn't decided whether an emergency was happening or not. Very familiar to those of us that live in the UK at the moment. Um, but a plan should have good triggers so that you know when to enact it. Give your plan action cards to use in an emergency. So literally, here's the 10 actions you must undertake in an emergency. Make these action cards wipe clean or waterproof. And I'm not joking about this because you can guarantee when you need them, it will be chucking it down or revolting. So keep those action cards really, really usable. Uh, avoid the fallacy of planning to plan, a really common error. Again, I read in plans all the time. Um, in the event of an emergency, a committee will be formed. Will it? Good luck with that, creating a committee when you've already got quite a lot of other things to deal with. Um, so don't plan to plan. Make sure that what you've got in your plans is exactly what you're going to need to rely on. Decide what you're going to share and what is need to know only. So, for example, you might feel it inappropriate to publicise things like your rendezvous points um, and that instead you should communicate these to teams as, you're ne as you need them. If you build trust and you build good communications, that's entirely appropriate because that team will know that you have their back when they need to and they'll trust you to provide the information when it's needed. Make sure your plans include subsidiarity. Um, subsidiarity is a principle used in emergency planning in a lot of places across the world, the UK no different. Um, it basically means that ensure that decisions are made at the lowest possible level and coordination happens at the highest necessary level. Um, that involves the transfer of decision making to the lowest uh, possible level, but supporting that with training, experience and empowerment. Um, this isn't designed to subvert hierarchical functions. It's designed to augment them. Um, 
by giving people uh, a role to do, but understanding that they know that role, but they know their limits and they know when to defer to higher authority. Um, pit crews are a great example of this. Your pit supervisor can stop the show, potentially. Um, they may not be very high in the overall pecking order of the overall organisation, but you want somebody in your pit to be able to stop your whole show. But why do you want that? Well, it means that decisions on the ground are taken by people who are absolutely clear about that situation on the ground. Information isn't lost in trying to communicate. It means the situation can be monitored locally. It frees your management layer to act in a tactical and strategic manner, um, strategic particularly often forgotten in the teeth of an emergency. It reduces the complexity of your command and it enables decisions to be taken in a really timely manner and this is something with all of my plans that I am absolutely uh, welded to and that's because if you're dealing with a crowd emergency you have 90 seconds to resolve a problem 90 seconds is the speed of compressive asphyxia and if your show has to go from the pit staff to the pit manager to the stage manager to event control to get permission to stop your show which is then communicated back down to the stage manager to the pit manager to the musicians it's too late you've gone beyond your 90 seconds so please think about how you empower people within your plan at the right levels to take the right decisions in a timely manner um, finally, always make sure that this is on the front of your plan. If an emergency is occurring and you have not read this plan, do not read it now. Turn to the action cards at the back of your plan. Give people something to do, even if this is the first time they've ever seen this plan. And finally, all of your plans, your planning process needs to be living and breathing documentation. Uh, this doesn't just mean taking it out of the filing cabinet, dusting it off once a year and making sure that the page numbers are right. It means that you need to make sure your plan is completely workable, that people understand their role in the plan, that they have an opportunity to practice that plan and that you as an organisation have learnt from your practice, that you see what works, what doesn't work, that you take feedback on board and you adapt plans based on that. So this training and exercising of a plan is part of the emergency planning process. It's back to why the process is different from simply writing a plan. And also remember, every plan is this dynamic document. It needs a local briefing to support it. Even if you have a single plan for a tour or a single plan for an event, it will mean different things to different people. So make sure your briefings back that up. But overall, what I hope you've taken away from this is that integrated emergency planning isn't just about your emergency plan. It's not just about that major incident document, which is where so many emergency plans start and end. Uh, what I hope you've got from this is that good emergency planning is a process. Um, it is an ongoing thing. It's not simply some words on a page. So um, thank you very much uh, for listening and uh, happy planning. Um, Andy questions thank you very much yes again i feel like i know nothing <laughs> thanks for doing that Emma. that was really good and um, we've, we've got lots of um questions coming through so i'm just going to start off with them um so dave white has, has led the way <laughs> Hi, dave. questions up first um so with the increase in driving concerts what's your thoughts on the redesign of emergency planning for these Obvious problems that if a car was to catch fire, it could be lethal with so many cars. How do you control moving vehicles in that scenario and what provision for non-starting of vehicles and all the health and safety aspects for staff working in the arena with moving cars? What's your yeah. thoughts? Um, oh, it's, it's a huge topic of interest at the moment, isn't it? Um, I wish I'd Absolutely. invested in car parks. Um, I, guess, <laughs> I guess if we're coming at this from an integrated plan, what does this mean? It means that we are starting from a risk basis that's very different. So from an integrated perspective, it is about going back to that risk assessment and really revising it from scratch. Let's, let's assume we know nothing about this event. This would appear to be the safest thing to do because I think a lot of assumptions for driving concerts are going to be very different, partly because of the risks we know, but also at the moment because of the risks we don't know. So um, Dave very accurately mentioned things like fire in a, in a live event. Now, I guess you could come at this from, from two perspectives. You might look at your average multi-story car park and go, well, they don't have fire so often, so that's 
that's reasonable to assume that there's a risk at a certain amount. But then equally, we look back at something like the Boomtown event, if we're using a greenfield site where in the end, hundreds of cars were, were damaged, uh, some of them terminally, um, in a huge fire outside the event, which actually threatened the structure of the event itself. Um, similarly, uh, was it the Manchester car park fire? Was it Manchester or Liverpool? One of the big uh, arenas had a car park fire a couple of years ago. Um, so again, it's going to be about um, how do we have alerting systems for that? What firefighting should we expect to be using for that? Um, having spoken to uh, members of the fire service uh, in recent years, they've suggested that you know even one substantial car fire is greater than the ability of a single firefighting appliance. So realistically, do you have what you need to fight a fire? I'd say in those circumstances, probably not. So your evacuation plans are going to need to be substantial, at which point you get back into the realms of social distancing. And is social distancing something that we have to stick to the whole time? Where there is a greater emergency and a greater threat to life, can social distancing be overlooked for the sake of getting people out? But once you get people out, how are you getting them home? Um, staff and moving vehicles. Oh, that just it, that fills me with horror. Absolute horror, um, because vehicle versus pedestrian uh, remains one of our biggest concerns I guess again it's about real staff awareness um, although having run gates at a major festival and had to try and teach my staff the simple tool of do not put your feet under a parked car when you lean into the window to talk to people even that was almost impossible to convey on a consistent basis um, so it's going to be a lot of high vis, a lot of speed limits some really strict rules we don't know how people are going to behave about alcohol uh, we don't know whether they're going to risk driving uh, impaired. Uh, we don't know how they're going to behave when they're in groups, in cars. We've got bathroom facilities to consider. Um, it's, it's a minefield. So my suggestion would be start your risk assessment from scratch and assume we know nothing. Thank you. Um, considering the dread hypothesis, uh, I've been told that we have to plan for, to perceived risk too. So planning for terror attacks is considerable, even though it's very unlikely. Uh, we do plan for the more likely to, though. I was wondering what your thoughts on planning for perceived risks are. Uh, so I guess that's that's about the idea of terrorism. Um, clearly, we have to plan for it. It's part of society now. We have to live with it. We plan for it for two reasons. One is to stop it happening. Um, but the second is to reassure our audiences that what we've created is a safe environment for them. Because that dread hypothesis doesn't just happen to us. It happens to our audiences as well. Um, and as we've seen from things like attacks on Christmas markets and so forth, it is, it is a real threat. It is something we need to be aware of. Um, I, I find that planning fascinating. I was working one particular event where we went to great lengths to not show the HVM preparation we'd put in place because we didn't want to frighten our audiences and change the nature of our event with huge concrete blocks and so forth. So we used agricultural equipment and things that they would normally have seen around the site. Um, and actually we got complaints that we hadn't put in any HVM, even though we had, because it was so well disguised. Um, so, you know, you've got to be aware of what the audience wants as well as uh, what the authorities require and what the genuine risk is. Um, what I would say is, is plan for it, but don't let it become your only focus. Don't let it overtake good generic planning for far more likely risks that are going to express on your site. Um, but also make sure, and this is a perfect example of integration, actually, make sure that you're all planning from the same perspective. Uh, I hear time and time and time again of people running events and they get to their event on the day only to discover that um, there's been a disconnect somewhere between them and the local law enforcement. And before you know it, there's a very unexpected transit van parked across a major egress route or um, somehow an egress route has been narrowed. Um, you've still got to be able to get people out of an event and that's still got to be safe and it can happen for all sorts of reasons that aren't necessarily terrorism related. So yes, plan for it. Make sure you're all joined up. Make sure all the agencies involved have bought into the risk assessment, understand the same thing and have agreed measures before the day and that those measures are proportionate and you haven't taken your eye off 
perhaps the more pedestrian things that we're not worried about because we've coped with them a million times, but that actually could snowball into far bigger incidents. Thank you very much. Um, have you got any advice for event organisers and crowd managers operating in jurisdictions where the type of interoperability that we have in the UK isn't the norm and generally aren't invited or accepted into the system uh, beyond getting events licensed? It's really tricky that because it is, as you note, um, a basic failure of integrated emergency management. Um, I really appreciate that people do struggle with that sometimes. They are seen as somehow outside plans for emergencies, which um, would be great if we thought that a safe resolution would come entirely from a completely strange agency that doesn't understand my plans dashing in um, or where uh, there's absolutely no flexibility because we're expected to comply so it's really hard um the best i can offer having not experienced it personally is to make sure that you've learned as much as possible about how those systems work and what they expect from you so that you are attempting to integrate with them even if they are not attempting to integrate with you that enables you to create plans that offer a balance and a recognition of those systems um, again one of the arts of emergency planning is about that fostering of relationships with authorities um, by creating um, good working relationships really to enable you to chip away at some of these structures that's really hard if you're on a big tour and you you know fly in and fly out of a jurisdiction probably not to be there over any great length of time um, it is a real problem um, and it's going to be a failure that hasn't we haven't seen the end of problems that come from failures like that thank you very much next question is, with the largely dysfunctional uh, safety advisory group set up in the uk how can we as event safety professionals push the subject of emergency planning integration how can we push it forward good question that's a, that's a good question this largely dysfunctional safety advisory group that's a bit harsh i've worked with some really good ones uh, i've worked with some pretty terrible ones too but some of them work really well um i mean obviously from a there are all sorts of flaws with the system there is no mandated competence to serve on a safety advisory group and i think that's something we come up against all the time um I guess this comes back to personal responsibility to a greater extent. Um, my, uh, the people will perhaps be aware of um, why I got into originally crowd management planning and particularly major incident planning. Uh, I came from a background as a person that liked free and alternative parties and all sorts of things like that. I, I don't have the traditional law enforcement background of many of our industry. Um, and people kept telling me I couldn't do things because it wasn't safe and i couldn't do things that i knew could be made safe um, so my ambition was to become better at this than the people telling me what to do um, so that they could no longer critique what was patently something that was possible to push the boundaries and that would be my advice to people get better at this than the people that are looking after us it's unfortunate that there are no mandated standards for safety advisory groups don't be afraid to push back and to question the qualifications of people who sit on safety advisory groups. Um, I, I had a, a, an amazing situation a couple of years ago where I'd created a crowd management plan with a dim ice in that crowd management plan. Um, and the person tasked with critiquing my crowd management plan from the safety advisory group wrote back and said, why, why is this all red, amber and green? I don't understand. Oh my God, you actually don't even know what you're looking at and that it's a fairly standard tool within our industry. Um, and now you're critiquing my plans. Um, be polite, share your experience. Um, don't be afraid to push back and don't be afraid to question the competence. Um, we've talked a lot about what is the legal position of safety advisory groups. We're going to be in a difficult state sooner or later where somebody unqualified to offer advice offers advice to an event that doesn't know any better and the event goes wrong um, so the dream space uh, example um, I'm surprised that didn't have greater ramifications to be honest where the local authority was found to be jointly liable for the accident um, we're going to end up in a position where sooner or later somebody prosecutes a safety advisory group more substantially um, and where they're implicated in a problem um, but be better than they are don't lose heart and don't be afraid to push back 
Thank you very much. Next question is, how do you advise promoting integration with stakeholders who work across multiple events and under multiple safety cultures and emergency plans? The ones that tend to revert to their standard operations instead of acting under your plans. It's tricky, isn't it? Um, that's all about relationship building. It's all about showing them the benefit of um, why working with your plans and system would be better. Find out what their trigger is. Um, I, I worked with um, a very rough and tumble crowd a few years ago who didn't like the idea that we were going to bring some kind of control and authority and planning to their event. Um, and I think perhaps they were, there was a veil of anarchy over what they were doing, but I found out what their trigger was. And their trigger was they needed the bar sales to make their event work. So I went back to them and I was just like, look, let's let's work with these plans. Let's let's integrate. Let's do it my way, because I can promise you if we do it my way, I will put up the traffic numbers through your site and I will increase your bar sales. And for them, that was the trigger. That was what made them buy in, because all of a sudden I dangled the biggest, juiciest carrot in the whole world in front of them. So I guess it sounds mean, but don't assume that people will do the right thing because doing the right thing is a good thing to do find out what the benefit to them of doing the right thing is and then use your relationship to sell it to them where you can and again it's really hard as you say if you're working across multiple jurisdictions and multiple events but companies of scale like that are often uh, all about the bottom line they're all about the value so persuading people of the longer term value and the protection of their operation might be the trigger that you need um, find, find their trigger and lean upon it shamelessly. I think especially for, for that question as well, when you come into an event as a new person perhaps and try and change everything that they've got, people don't like change, do they? And no. and this is what sometimes sort of clouds their judgment as well. We, we've worked with an organisation recently and they asked us to write a, a series of plans for them. And because it looked different to what they'd already had, it wasn't even about the content, it looked different. And that was a real stumbling point. It was a real issue. So we just changed the look of it. It's the same content. And then it was great. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it it's stakeholder management at that point. You're absolutely right. It's, um, it's why should people trust you if they don't know you, yeah. you know, so you've got to build that trust up, uh, sometimes quite slowly. Um, although that's really difficult, isn't it? Cause you're doing it in a fast paced, fast moving organization where we're contracted year by year by year you have to make yourself a little bit vulnerable to them there's a bit of give and take find out their needs um, find them out quickly but yeah it's it's about good relationships and, and yeah being aware that people are frightened of change um sometimes just for change's sake not everybody copes with change very well um and in the live events industry where literally change swirls around us all the time you might be that bit of change that just pushes people over the edge so you know prepare them for the change support them through it definitely and the answer to that change is always it's always been all right isn't it yeah probably the most dangerous set of phrases in the event industry that's not how we do things around here yeah, absolutely <laughs> next question um i work for a local authority as a senior events officer is it acceptable in my event safety management plans that the section on emergency planning simply refers to council's day-to-day -day plan to be implemented I've always argued that it shouldn't for several reasons. And I always I work with very inexperienced event organisers who don't, uh, do not see or do not see the importance of emergency planning and expect the council's day-to-day -day plan to take over. Now I've got my own thoughts on this one as well, because I've seen this a number of times with local authorities. As Go well. for it, Andy, you, you start. Um, it depends who has access to those plans, doesn't it? Um, it's, all, it's all very well referring to the council's day-to-day -day plans, but are they made available to the, to the right people that need to see them? Is, is my thoughts on it. Now, I've seen um, events over the years where this has been the case, especially with councils. It's always been in the plan. Yeah, this section refer to the council's plans. We know that's been updated or it's, it's regularly checked. But who really has access to the council's plans um, to deal with an emergency? And are we assuming that everyone's got access to it? It's okay saying refer to it, but if no one knows where it is or has never seen it, it's, it's, it's of no use to anybody, in my opinion, anyway. I absolutely agree. Um, you can't abdicate responsibility for planning by just pushing it to somebody else. Um, 
if you don't know what's in the council's plans, do they contain enough to deal with the specifics of your event, especially if you are based somewhere where you are substantially going to change the population of that area, either in its size or its makeup? Um, do those plans genuinely have the capability to react at the speed that you need? Um, we talk about this golden hour in major incident disaster. If you're falling back entirely to a set of uh, LRF um, plans, then absolutely no. Um, you need to be able to manage that emergency way before the Cat 1 responders are going to be able to get on scene to support you. Um, and we have a duty to be organised and we have a duty to take responsibility for our actions if we don't take responsibility for what we're creating how can people ever trust us if you have an event organizer that's unwilling to take responsibility for their own audience and their own event then that is not acceptable you're absolutely correct um it, they, they must dovetail they must augment local plans there must be a connection and integration between them but I'm hard pushed to think of much beyond the village fate that wouldn't actually require at least a basis of its own major incident planning Certainly what we've done before, when this has been the case for local authorities, we've put a copy of that plan in as an appendix into the plan as well, and refer to this appendix where the plan sits, so it's available. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, what's your opinion on, on legislation mandating a focus on dread hypothesis, for example, Martin's Law, Zonex, and its weighted influence on planning? Uh, I have a very not a low opinion of all the laws i can understand why people want them um i think it I, I return back to this all events should be planned from a basis of risk um and you've got to have a realistic appraisal of what the risk is at your event i don't believe that there is anything blanket that is appropriate um should there be an assessment of that risk yeah absolutely and if if martin's law mandates an assessment of risk um now, all events should have that included anyway. So I guess my first question would be, what's already wrong with the risk management process on a greater level if we're having to mandate that separately? Um, what else are we missing? Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm naturally wary of anything that makes a blanket application of something because uh, not only will it potentially add an unnecessary and inappropriate burden and potentially distract from more substantial risks um, but also people tend to take blanket approaches and they tend to take copy and paste approaches in those circumstances and copy and paste approaches to risk assessment are worse than almost no risk assessment so i'm just i'm just naturally very wary of anything like that um, anything that mandates things like hvm and so forth i'm really anxious that that should always be looked at by a qualified planner a qualified crowd planner because um, it's all well and good sticking hvm on a venue but what does that then mean for your egress times what does it mean for your queue protection all of these things uh need to be taken into concern risk is a holistic process okay i like this next question from here um question has come from a question what are our thoughts on mitigating the risk of vehicle borne explosives at drive-in events so that's um from my point of view it's, it's similar it needs to be in your planning of course um there is a risk there it depends how big these events are as well but it certainly is a risk and as our landscape changes we have to change our planning accordingly we've seen it over the years with drones as well also we had a problem with drones at events and we had to plan for the eventuality potentially that that could be uh, carrying something and could drop something on our crowds um with for me with vehicle borne explosives and things like that it's it's part of the risk assessment as always um we do it in stadiums as well with part of the, the ct plan for the stadium so we're going to have to adapt that i think and it's going to have to be a consideration as, as as much as any other risk mm. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it goes from searching them through a, an arch or a wand and emptying pockets out as people come to the door of searching vehicles. Um, and it might be simple things that you mandate if somebody comes to your event, if the boot of their car isn't empty, they don't get in. Um, but we're also going to have to train staff with what to look for um, because VBIDs can be hard to spot unless you've got qualified staff. I've seen staff waving mirrors underneath cars and just 
side with horror at the the whole theater of the piece because it's quite clear people have no idea what they're looking for um so it's about uh, appropriate risk management it's about appropriate training and it's it's about contraband rules that apply to cars as well as apply to everything else so if you can't take a bag into a football stadium why should you be able to bring a boot full of something into a into a um an outdoor event i don't know let's reinvent our rules yeah and i guess the consideration has to be given also to to traffic management at this point as well because we're starting to search vehicles we don't want to be creating big on the tailbacks onto a roads and and such like otherwise these events will be shut down straight away Absolutely. So i think they're going to need sites big enough to be able to accommodate these things yeah and perhaps we can do some research on flow rates of cars coming in when they're being searched <laughs> could be interesting thanks Diane. um how do we make sure or be confident that our plans and integrated planning with emergency services is known and understood by the operative personnel who will be the ones marching in when when the emergency happens so how do you communicate your plans um yeah one of the most important things to do and one of the biggest problems um it depends on the staff and who and how um so sometimes it's about distilling the wisdom of those plans for certain people so for instance i talked about that example of catering staff needing to know their role in an emergency um the football club that i worked with um simply gave them an action card that was on the back of their match day laminate that told them in 10 easy things what are you going to do um nice simple suggestion there um, some of it is more complicated some of it will require your supervisors reading some versions of plans some of it will require teams to read plans so sometimes that requires you actually paying them for the time to read the plans and i know that's hard to swallow and a lot of places don't like to do that they just like to pay for absolutely hours that the boots are on the ground um but sometimes also it's a responsibility for for reading plans and making sure people have read them um maybe through briefing maybe through training and exercising maybe through on the spot checks um i'm aware of uh, crowd management plans that I know members of teams haven't read, uh, for example, because I'm sneaky and old fashioned and glue them together with Rizzlers to see if that ever gets broken. Um, but that's because I'm evil. Um, so it, it's a matter of training, exercising, giving people the opportunity to learn. A lot of people really want to know about emergency arrangements because they want to know how they'll keep themselves safe. So, you know, underpin the value of those to people as well for themselves. There's a bit of self interest in there. Um, but it's about distilling the wisdom into the appropriate size chunks and getting it out in an appropriate manner, be it on an action card, in a briefing, in an exercise, whatever that might be. But don't try and just dump the whole plan on people. Chop it down into the bits that they need. It's interesting. It comes out that when we're talking about an integrated approach and, and involving other members of staff in evacuation procedures and emergency procedures, mm. uh, um, we often talk to some of our customers about who's involved in the in the emergency response and very often we get told that the cleaners are a big part of it the cleaning team which is great um, but the cleaning team is, is supplied by a contractor so how do we assure that that contractor is given the correct training to these people and um, to be aware of what an emergency is and understand the, their role in an emergency how does that get managed so an organization's brought this contractor in how do they assure that that contractor has done this training with their staff and how and they're capable of doing the role yeah it's a perfect example of um of the need for integration and i guess at that point as well it's it's partly contract management and again we talk about these things that are distal to emergency planning and you would never think that appropriate contract management might be entirely relevant but that's a great example um but also that comes down to audit as well um and at that point if you are going to devolve that responsibility that let's let's be honest that very key and important responsibility if you're going to devolve that outside staff you have direct contract contact with like any contract you've got to audit whether it's deliverable absolutely um general question about university world for you okay are you changing your 2021 curriculum to assume that COVID-19 is here to stay for the next one, two, five years or more? And will you be teaching to plan for the 2019 context for, uh, or for events from 2021 onwards? 
so I guess it's a sort of a two part question is one is the, the sort of the means of delivery and the answer to that is um, the university's yet to make a decision, but we've transferred everything online. Um, at the end of the day, we teach emergency planning and crowd management and we always try and reflect contemporary issues. Um, within crowd management, I'm not going to stop teaching people to cram for, plan for crowded places. Uh, because they will be back one day. Humanity's like that. Um, we like crowds. We like big events. Um, things are going to look different, but eventually we, I firmly believe we will be back to where we were because that is the nature of humans. Um, so I'm still going to be teaching all the absolutely relevant stuff about crowded places. Um, we will be looking at what we do to keep people safe and secure in this changed environment. It's just a slightly different set of calculations, isn't it? It's it's making sure we're understanding the psychological impacts of this on people, making sure we're creating the right spaces for people, um, making sure we're looking at the impact of reduced numbers, great accuse. Um, so we'll be giving it context, but my underpinnings remain the same. I think emergency planning will probably change, should we say more dramatically, but probably for the better. Um, in so much as uh, we've seen what's happened within the UK, uh, I suspect there'll be several inquiries to come about what's happened in the UK um, and about the interplay between central government and local government and particularly about the longer term impacts of uh, the mitigatory factors on emergencies. So I think we'll probably see a revisiting of some of those processes in the UK as we previously saw a revisiting with the introduction of Jessup following the 7-7 bombings. Um, so um, the idea is that we'll, we'll stay contemporary, we try and keep our case studies contemporary, but certainly in the world of crowds, it's the volumes of crowds that, you know, kill people if after all what we've been teaching about is preventing density and preventing sudden movement, physics isn't going to change during this period. So a lot of the underpinnings will stay the same, but we'll make sure that we've got some contemporary context. Brilliant. In the absence of proper local authority rules or competence, are there any internationally acceptable best practice or decided cases that we can refer to in order to enforce the principle of duty of care and best practice? Uh, I wouldn't know about uh, internationally sort of things we do you mean things we can hold up as best practice? Yeah, I think this is for countries who don't necessarily have a safety advisory group function or, or any advice from, from local government or, or councils. So is there anything uh, that people can refer to? I, I guess guidance would be good in this. Yeah, case. exactly. Um, go back go back to the spirit of the guidance, if perhaps not how it's actually practiced in the UK. So we talk about safety advisory groups and as I say, people are very mixed, um, mixed experiences. I, I sit on some that are fantastic. Um, and where real trouble is taken to, to be that critical friend to the event and to create good relationships um, and where the, the agency both strives for competence but also defers to competence when it's offered. Um, but go back to the spirit of the guidance rather than necessarily how it's executed because the spirit of safety advisory groups is potentially a really great thing um, but they aren't given sufficient support and we don't have these mandated uh, levels of competence but the idea is that there should be a competent authority so um, I'd, I'd recommend going back to that guidance as a starting position. Okay so I know some of the guidance whether it be the um, guide to safety sports grounds or the purple guide and things like that are being more, used more and more internationally as, as some best practice mm -hmm. guidance so I'm not sure it's legislation that you can refer to but as we say more guidance than, than anything internationally. Okay, is there one key message for crowd safety professionals, something you wish we would or wouldn't do? Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh God, there's millions. Um, <laughs> uh, remember that you're part of something bigger. Remember that you're part of something bigger. Crowd safety is so often applied as like this gloss of varnish over a finished event to tick a box and make it watertight. Emergency planning is so often applied just as, oh, we've got a plan, tick you're part of something bigger um effective emergency planning is about those really good relationships it's about stakeholder management the same as good crowd management um if you operate in a silo you're useless you need to be 
absolutely connected. You're almost the glue that connects a, a large event together. Think of yourself as part of a bigger system and how you operate. Brilliant. Okay. We try and get through all these. There's a few left. Um, after COVID-19, what are the ingredients to get trust back in the crowd? Uh, we have to make new plans where we take this and what should be involved. It's going to be tricky, isn't it? I'm not a crowd psychology specialist. I would defer um, absolutely to the work of people like Mr. Drury and Mr. Riker, um, Dr. Drury and Dr. Riker, because they're, they're really the specialists in this. But my feeling is that they've got, they've got to trust us which we can show them through our actions and through our deeds. So we've got to communicate with them in advance about what we're doing so that they feel comfortable with the situation that they're walking into. Um, we might assume we've made something safe, but people will just worry right up to the event if they haven't seen it. So, you know, share explicitly with your audiences what they're going to see, what the processes are going to be, how you're going to make that separation if we need it, and what you expect of them. Um, starting to have conversations with people, I will admit that it's not something I've been fully vested into this point because I've been uh, teaching frantically and moving my, my teaching online, and now I'm starting to look at this recovery process. Um, and I think we need to... We need to look at how we're communicating what we do to people. But everybody I've talked to so far suggests that egress is going to be the real problem for us because we've, we've got used to social distancing queuing into supermarkets. We've got used to social distancing queuing outside shops. That's the easy bit. We know how to do that. But also, if you think about humans being driven by this idea of maximal utility, what do I get? What drives me to make the decisions I make? Um, on egress, there's suddenly a lot of competing features. We're no longer simply um, competing to get in to see the show. We're competing to get out first to make it to public transport. We're competing to get out to make it to the car park before anybody else does. We're competing to get home before the babysitter starts charging me double time at midnight. Um, we're competing just to get out because I'm bored and my time is more important than yours. Right? So all of a sudden, I think we've got a ripe ground for conflict and concern as people that want to socially distance aren't finding their needs met in egress because their needs are also about speed of egress or people that want to be socially distant being overwhelmed by people who suddenly have different priorities. So, and, and you know, people following rules of these things, some audiences will follow rules really easily, some won't. Um, some will admit they're scared by close proximity some people won't admit that they're scared. Some people won't be scared by close proximity. Um, you only need to look at the gangs of teenagers roaming my neighbourhood on bicycles to understand who's scared and who isn't scared of proximity. Um, so I think it's about communicating with all the audiences, knowing your audience, sharing your plans with them, recognising those flashpoints and starting to think what it is you can do about those flashpoints. Does your concert have to finish earlier? Do you have to do hold back systems like football fans have got used to over the years? How are you going to train people in those? How are you going to keep things moving? What are the impediments to that movement? Um, so it's going to be about planning, but it's going to be about advanced communication so that our audiences know what they're walking into, can be confident about what they're walking into and know what their part in it is. Brilliant. That question did actually come up in a similar context when John, during John Drury's um, webinar uh, the other week which he's doing again on june the 5th shameless plug um, <laughs> so he's um he discussed about the, the need for feeling safe and when we start to just look at the general needs of a human even maslow's theories and um people need to feel safe and at events we discussed that we need to give them the information and what's being put into place to make them feel safe but how does that then start to change and and taking on board what you just said about egress if people are drunk at events or under the influence of whatever um social distancing goes out the window we only we see this on the beaches of south end and brighton and at the moment we saw it in the ve day parties at the other week uh, they might start off two meters apart but as soon as they've had a few glasses of wine or a few beers that goes out the window mm -hmm. um and then there's the added consideration of people self-policing that social distancing. 
So if we haven't got sufficient numbers of security and crowd safety stewards to show that that's actually actively being managed, people will start to try and police that themselves. And then it's overzealous policing that then leads to conflict and even more issues. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something we need to bear in mind. And, and I mean, it's it's amazingly unknown territory, isn't it? This is this is part of the worry about it. You know, we've we've looked at things like issues of trust in football and how you get crowds on side, and we've learnt that you know negotiation and involvement of that audience is absolutely key. Um, you know, we did try to police them in a heavy-handed manner through the 80s and the 90s, and it wasn't remarkably successful. Um, so it's been about different styles um you know some of clifford stott's work might be really important in this regard um about negotiation and the part that the audience has to play so yeah there's so much about it that's unknown at the moment and um yeah those early days there's going to be a lot of learning i think it's absolutely vital that we and i've only just thought of this idea so i don't know how to do it um but as a community we're going to have to create a space to share our experiences and our information very very quickly as a crowd safety community, because we will all be learning this stuff at exactly the same time. Um, and we've really got to take advantage of learning from each other. Um, you know, we talk about that creation of generative safety culture being about learning from each other. Um, maybe this is the opportunity for us to put it into practice. Perhaps I'll start like a website or a blog or something that just gets people to record their experiences. Um, but just something where we can share information really quickly. Absolutely. We're starting to do this through the, the next edition of the, the Crowd magazine as well. Perfect. So we're doing some um, analysis of the differences in how people have been managing supermarket crowds mm -hmm. and queues across the world. So we're looking at the UK, we're looking at various other countries as well and comparing the differences. So the, the magazine could be a tool to, to share that knowledge and get it out quickly via the app or, or via the magazine as well. If that was that was useful. Yeah, no, great idea. Okay, um, next question. I own a cleaning contractor and can say that we are very rarely included in the dissemination of any planning information. Okay, I think that's a, a point rather than a question for, yeah, yeah. for discussion. Um, if, if you were involved in the evacuation process, you should be involved in the yeah, remind, of information. Remind the head owner of the contract what you can do for them. You know, everybody talks about the resources they need in an emergency. As a cleaning contractor, you've presumably got a lot of human resource on site at any given time. Remind them of the value of what you can offer. Okay. Next one. Uh, for stadiums and zone X, do we have any thoughts on where liability of emergency plans sit between the venue and local council for occurrences that are outside the footprint of the safety certificate? And this is going to be a different answer whether you're talking to the Sports Ground Safety Authority, the local authority, uh, or other stakeholders, I would suggest. Isn't that a giant hot potato? Um, it's, <laughs> I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? Nobody knows the answer to that. Zone X arrived, all of a sudden we were responsible apparently for um, a, a sig potentially significant footprint beyond the curtilage of our events. Um, it's going to be really tricksy. My, my gut feeling is that if it's off your curtilage, to an extent, you, they're going to struggle to prosecute in any meaningful sense. Um, however, um, there's a difference between responsibility, legal responsibility, moral responsibility. Um, it's going to come down to a, a stadium by stadium agreement because, again, it's got to be about that relationship between yourself and the authorities. And, a, you know, a, a license, again, should be an expression of a good negotiation. It shouldn't simply be a tick in a box. The, the plans that support a license should be the expression of a good negotiation. Um, but the fact that it's going to have to be a negotiated settlement all the way through this is problematic. The fact that there will clearly be legal challenges. Um, I don't know the answer immediately is is the the overall feeling because there are so many different factors with each different circumstance you know sometimes you will be looking to to win the favor of the local authorities and the agencies and you might be willing to be more flexible because you've got deeper pockets other clubs might just not have the pockets to stretch and it might be the difference between surviving and not so they can't enter into that engagement it's going to be different for everybody um so i guess there's no give an answer at the moment, but they have left us in an invidious position. I think from my point of view, when you are running a stadium, exact, things that you could do in that stadium may change your egress profile, how that works. 
And if you were to do that, for example, if you were to close the car parks of your stadium, where people are used to driving to your stadium, and then you've now got an increase in footfall and, and higher density crowd moving away from your venue, and then there's a crowd crush at a certain point on, on the, the routes out in the zone X area in the last mile, have you influenced that incident by changing your plans in the stadium? Have you communicated those plans? And we, we, I'm using this example because it's something we worked on. And the car parks were closed and then there was approximately 20 to 30,000 people heading for a footbridge that was a metre and a half wide. Doesn't work. But that was probably half a mile away from the stadium, maybe more. So we're in the Zone X territory, the last mile. Um, Whose responsibility is that? It's not really the local council's responsibility that you've changed your plans, which has then increased footfall and, and caused the risk. And for me, on greenfield sites, for years I saw people and just planning for this crowd safety for the arena only, for the yeah. fence bit. And there were so many problems going on on the, the route walks up and the walks out, or yeah. footpaths that couldn't accommodate the size of crowd when you had a hard finish and just chucked them all out at once. And then there's yep. people in the, in the roads and things. So from my point of view, I think the Zone X last mile area is the responsibility of the event or the stadium. Um, if it's difficult, isn't issues. it? Because it has to be shared because it's perfectly plausible that something will happen in that space that's unrelated to your crowd, but that then involves your crowd as well. Yeah. And you, you've got to be in a position where it's almost something where we say it has to be the responsibility of everybody because there are things that could happen that are completely unrelated to your event. Now, is it fair to ask you to take responsibility for those? Potentially not. Do you have a part to play in that response? Absolutely. Um, uh, and things like the bridge where you let everybody out, you know, partly it's like, well, how, how do you do whole back? Think of it as a system. Where can you influence things all the way through? Because you know about that problem further on in the system, further on in the flow. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You do have to, I'm not saying don't take responsibility for it by no means. You do have to take some responsibility, but again, it should be shared. It should be negotiated and you need to recognize the impact that you have. Definitely. We have to think of this wider picture. Okay. Uh, what's the panel's thought on competency standards for SAG members, which include event crowd safety? Would this ensure a more consistent approach by SAGs in the UK if they had to be trained, basically, to be part of the SAG group? I like that question. Uh, I've got an undergrad who's writing their whole dissertation on this very subject at the moment. It's going to be like dropping a bomb on people. Um, so let's think about competence. Uh, what's the classic definition under the HSA? Kate, knowledge, ability, training and experience. Um, yeah do i think that there should be a level of training for sags absolutely do i think they should have got their boots out on the ground to be truly competent yes i do because they often mandate things which we all know would be impossible to carry out realistically so it isn't just about training for sag members as far as i'm concerned it's about um genuinely making sure that they have the knowledge and that they've been trained but also do they have the ability both to sit on a sag and to understand an event and have they gained some experience of what they're saying so that we don't just end up you know i couldn't i couldn't teach what i do if i didn't do it in real life for six months of the year to make sure that i'm proposing things that are workable and doable um and i think that it's got to be true competence it's not just got to be a bit of training absolutely i've heard some stories recently of a, a sag group requesting a crowd management plan, a completed crowd management plan before the let event would be licensed um, up front. Very early on in the SAG process, the event's just been being planned. It's a long time off and they want a completed crowd management plan in a couple of days. Um, it's just not going to happen. It's, it's a, a live document. It's constantly evolving. Yeah, Again, absolutely. down to the lack of understanding. Again, and it's, it's the lack of understanding of what we do. It's the lack of understanding of how events work. But it's, it's also the fact that local authorities are themselves extremely pressed at times. I mean, I, the horror stories I hear, I was teaching second year undergraduates last year um, and we were talking about safety advisory groups. And one of them piped up smiling. Oh, I've sat in a safety advisory group. And I looked at him and I'm like, you're, you're, you're 19. How have you sat in a safety advisory group? He said, oh, I did six weeks work experience at the council last summer and they were short of someone on the control of major accident hazards group. <laughs> oh, 
oh my god um and there is there is frequently bums on seats um you know it's it's beyond a joke um and they would be found extremely wanting if if the worst had happened so it needs it's not just if, if it's any consolation it's not just crowds it applies to it is things like control of major accident hazards petrochemicals those you know th th those kind of things um and so we're we're all suffering from it it's a flawed system throughout it's not just crowds um but they do need to take some responsibility for that years ago we used to know the sort who was had some experience by the uh, condition of their purple guide that they put down on the desk as they walked into the sag group and just <laughs> left there for show they didn't know anything that was in it but if it was a bit shabby they've obviously done it a few times so. <laughs> okay next question what are your thoughts on event liability for the transmission of infectious diseases ah it's fascinating that one um i guess Hang on, I'm just writing that down. <sighs> what do I guess? I'm not guessing. Um, we have a duty of care to everybody who comes to our event. We can only base that duty of care on what we know at the time. Uh, I think the two big examples that have made it into the news this week were the, was it the Champions League match and the Cheltenham race event. Um, but there's also been some other local events that have been called out for scrutiny, things like the Bath Half Marathon. Um, do those people have a duty to close their event before they've officially been guided to? That's that's really problematic. Um, we needed better guidance from government. We needed uh, government to step up as and and tell us what couldn't happen so that we could negotiate with our insurers, so that we could deal with our cancellations, so that we could stop people taking what actually turned out to be extremely risky decisions. I understand that um, there's potentially 41 cases been traced back to that, that Champions League match at this point. Um, so it's a really difficult and vexed area. Um, should individual events and organisations take the hit when they're not given good advice? Tricksy, very difficult. Um, you know, we all have to earn a living out of this, but um, at the time, was there enough information to enable people to make such substantial and significant decisions? I don't think there was enough enough um, enough information available to people at that point. I think the event industry should be very proud of how it's reacted, um, because the event industry has shut itself down substantially in the UK. But it's been us that have done that. Um, we've taken responsibility for it. We've had to but we've done it and event organisers have stepped up to the mark and taken really difficult decisions. Um, yes, we do have to make judgments about what keeps our public safe, but we needed better advice as well. Brilliant. Okay, folks, can we just not put any more questions up now? Because I'm conscious we're going to run out of time and, and I don't want to disappoint anybody. Um, question in the disaster cycle, what's the difference between prevention and mitigation? Why is mitigation not part of prevention risk management uh, mitigation is largely seen as something larger the societal whole so um, prevention might be what you do on your site so it might be um, things like making sure you've got good trackway or um, ensuring that you've got a really good supply of wood chip or things like that mitigation is seen as the larger societal measures that help to keep you secure so it might be about bringing in laws regarding health and safety it might be about things like taking a proactive um, stance regarding um, drug education and crime prevention. It's about those bigger changes rather than simply stopping something happening at its source. Mitigation is seen as societal changes that you can make that influence safety. Brilliant. Do you think it will ever be a condition of entry that attendees bring requested PPE for themselves? Would that be a realistic approach? Uh, I think we could all imagine an event where we're requiring someone to wear a mask. They're talking about that on the underground in the next couple of weeks. So if a mask is their own PPE, then uh, potentially, yes, of course, that brings a, a wealth of problems. Is it appropriate PPE? Is it in-date PPE? Um, it might be that we ask them to buy from a certain supplier. I don't think it's out of the question if we're talking about something as simple <coughs> as a mask, potentially. Um, but as we know, there are problems with masks. They're not effective PPE unless they're well fitted, uh, appropriately maintained, and people aren't touching them and grubbing about with them. So um, we need to be very careful, but I don't think it's out of the question. 
I don't think it'll be long before um, it's sold as a sponsorship point either. <laughs> yep. With lo oh. logos on masks and... and nice big white empty system. space. It'd be the only thing we haven't mm. stuck a logo on so far, if it is. Absolutely. I'm going to put my hand up for that one. <laughs> okay. Um, it's that one. Following on from the, the SAG question and the answer, is there any move or pressure being applied to get those standards in place? I guess we'd deflect that one to Eric. He'd be the best person to... Um... I was going to say, Eric would be the first person I'd ask. Hi, Eric, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony, we'll push that one on to Eric and see if we can get that one offered, uh, answered offline. Um, maybe the UK CMA can push that forward. Um, do you feel that the government is placing too much onus on event organisers for the responsibility for COVID secure premises, or is it too much political pressure to resume events? Oh, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, do I think they're placing too much pressure? If by not giving us sufficient advice in early days, that was certainly too much pressure um, and too much onus. Um, we haven't yet seen substantial support. I understand that there are working groups who've started out. Um, those working groups certainly don't cover all the industries that I'm involved in. Um, and the festival industry particularly appears to be very poorly represented in that regard so far. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to understand um, how that will work because we face different pressures because not only do we have the pressures of the, the high levels of audience, um, we have to provide sanitation facilities, we have to provide toilets, we have to provide showers, all of those things, which again puts us in a, a different position, but we're outdoors and therefore presumably there are different areas where the risk is less. Um, at the moment, it just feels like we're not getting enough guidance. Okay. And the final question, it's more of a discussion point, I think. Um, very early on in, into your, your talk, you spoke about the um, assumption that staff will know what to do in the event of emergencies. And how many organisers, safety or security companies are, are able to do live exercises with their staff? I'm guessing that would be really restricted to arenas, wouldn't it? We don't really get much time to do that in greenfield sites. Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It depends how you think of exercises. Um, so certainly at Glastonbury, we do a substantial number of exercises with key staff. Um, there is a whole week of emergency planning exercises in the traditional sense. But exercises can be really short. Exercises can be flash exercises. It can be instigating a discussion among groups of staff who are stood around at a gate for an hour while it's quiet at the beginning or end of a shift you know there are interesting opportunities you know there's it's there's there's quiet times there's break times there's stuff you can ask staff to talk about while they're queuing to pick up their uniform an exercise doesn't have to be a full-on tabletop it can just be a whole oh what would you do if it could be a whole oh how would you cope with or oh have you ever seen um there can be lots of small flash opportunities to train your staff. Um, so just don't think of it all as great big exercises. There's all sorts of small stuff you can do. Brilliant, so that, that was the final question. Thank you very much, Emma. Thanks for no a worries. great talk. Thank you and to everybody. All those questions. Um, those of you who are interested, uh, some of you entered our competition to win a free place on our next level five award in crowd safety management. Um, so to prove it's real and to prove we actually do give this away, uh, I'm just going to share my screen and Emma is going to press the button to decide who's the winner. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I just need to give you remote control of my computer. So Emma, if you could press the button, that'd be wonderful. And we'll see who wins. Well, fingers crossed, everybody. Well done, Dave. Uh, if you want to contact me, then we'll arrange to get you booked in on the course that starts next week. Um, and we'll start the competition again as of today.
great. Fantastic. Well, thanks for your time, everybody. I appreciate people are busy at the moment. It's it's really nice of you to have taken the time to to stick with us today. And thanks to Andy for the opportunity for this. Well, thank you very much for your time. And thanks very much, everybody else. Um, if you've got any questions afterwards, feel free to fire them over in an email to me, and I will do my best to get them answered or get some helpful discussion around them. Yeah, and um, if people want to know more about courses at Coventry, again, pop the questions through Andy, and I'm um, happy to answer them. Yeah, you should get a follow-up email tomorrow with um, the links to the master's degree at Coventry University that Emma looks after. Um, so that will be in the link tomorrow. Next Wednesday, we have the next webinar on what to expect from your event medical supply. Um, so we're looking at what, what plans they should be producing, what sort of levels of cover. Um, is there any alternatives from the, the guidance and maybe the green guide or the purple guide? Uh, can you sort of go away from that slightly with better trained staff, with extra paramedics, with extra doctors, things like that. So Alan will be discussing that next week. Um, and next Friday as well is also a rerun of uh, Professor John Drury's um, talk, um, which was really interesting the other week that a lot of people couldn't get into. It was, it was really busy. Um, but we're going to run that again next Friday on the 5th. So if you signed up to our mailing list, you'll get the links. If not, you can sign up to the mailing list, um, which I'm sure you've all seen the, the links for as well. So thanks very much, everyone, and um, take care, and we'll see you next week.